praise the Lord. This is Elder Henry Reinhardt coming to you on a Thursday, and I hope all of you are well. Today I want to do a teaching, and I want to talk about the issue of peace. I want to talk about peace. A little over 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus came into the world, and he came on a mission to preach and teach the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As I say again and again, when I teach on certain topics, the ministry of the Lord Jesus on earth was specifically and only to the Jew to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And when Jesus came and as the people, as the Jews became more and more familiar with, it, with him, some of them were convinced that he was their long promised Messiah that he was the one that was going to come and going to deliver them from their Roman oppressors and he was going to bring peace and establish his earthly kingdom as the scriptures had said. But they misunderstood the purpose of the Lord Jesus at this time. Their thinking was in error. And I say to you today, as I prepare to teach this lesson, that Jesus did not come, contrary to what the Jews were thinking, Jesus did not come to bring peace on earth during his first ministry upon the earth. Having said that, individually, we can yet have perfect peace, and I'll deal with that Lord willing, toward the end of this teaching. But the Lord Jesus did not come to bring peace on earth. From Matthew chapter 10 and verse 34, Jesus said, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. This was the Lord Jesus talking to the Jews. Now those words were spoken by our Lord during his ministry on the earth, which I, as I said was specifically and only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The context of that passage is when Jesus was preparing to send out the twelve apostles during their training. Prior to his death on the cross and prior to their regeneration of being born again of water and spirit. He gave them the guidelines, the 
they were to follow as they went about preaching and performing all manner of healing. Then Jesus began to speak into the future and to remind them that if they denied him before men, he would also deny them before his Father in heaven. But then he began to say some things to them that I am sure surprised the apostles. Most of those who believed that Jesus was the Christ thought that he had come at that time to deliver them from the Roman government and to establish his kingdom and to bring peace on earth according to the scriptures. However, Jesus corrected their thinking. He told them he had not come to send peace on earth. In fact, he had come to send a sword. The sword is the word of God. And the truth of the message of salvation causes divisions in families and turns fathers against sons and daughters against mothers. It turns in-laws against one another, sometimes with deadly consequences. We read about such things from time to time in our newspaper or, or we hear it in the television news reports. Many times our greatest enemies are those of our own household because of the word of God and because of salvation. In an unsaved household, when one of the family gets saved, it causes a change in that individual's life, whoever it is that gets saved, by the, by the fact that they are now born again, that causes a change in their life. Suddenly, the old things that they used to do, they don't do anymore. The way they used to talk, they don't talk that way anymore. Places they used to go, they don't go there anymore. They have become a light shining out amidst a world of darkness and against the darkness in their home. And that light brings condemnation on those family members yet dwelling in darkness. I remember my own experience almost 49 years ago when I was yet a single young man of 20 years old. Once I was saved, I stopped cursing like the Marine that my mother had been used to. I stopped drinking and getting intoxicated with the liquor that I used to drink. I stopped hanging around the former associates that I used to hang around with. I stopped chasing the skirts that used to occupy my thoughts daily. My very presence after I was born again began to seriously irritate 
my mother to the point that she told me to get out of her house. And I would hear her speaking negatively about God and about me living for him. She did not want me to be around, she did not want to be around it or me anymore. She didn't want to be around me anymore. Not because she hated her son, but because she didn't care for what her son had become. And she did not like what was within him, the Lord. And she didn't want it in her house anymore. As long as I was in the world and was of the world, she was happy with me being around. But once I received the Holy Ghost, the light of Christ in my life brought condemnation upon her and the life that she was living. She didn't hate me again, but she hated what I had come to stand for. You see, the friend of the world is God's enemy. There is an automatic enmity between God and those who are children of the devil living according to the world, and, and, you know, those that are in the world and of the world, they don't realize it, but they are children of the devil. And they are under his power and under his deception and under his, his control, for he is the God of this world. So they, they don't realize it, most of them, but when you are of the world, you are children of the devil. So when an individual in the family gets saved and you all are living together, that automatically causes a difference to be made and it causes enmity to be there that was not there before. As long as all of you in the world and doing the same things, walking by the same rules, cursing and swearing and drinking or whatever else you may be doing, everything was just fine. But as soon as one of you, maybe a son, maybe a daughter, maybe a husband, a wife, whatever the case may be, as soon as one of you gets saved, it causes enmity to develop, and it causes friction. And many times, the people who, whom you're living with, they don't want you around anymore because you, your very presence, brings condemnation upon the life that they're living. But it doesn't stop the children of God. Once we're saved and in the body of Christ, not everyone is filled with God's Spirit and walking in the Spirit. Glory to God. You see, they may, the people that are in the church, Talking about saved people now. People that are in the church that have repented, have been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, have been filled with the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. You find out that not everyone that is filled with God's Spirit is walking in the Spirit. Many of God's people are carnal, walking in the flesh. Because of this, it causes contentions, division, and enmity 
among God's people. Saints who are walking in the flesh don't want to be around those who are walking in the spirit because it brings them into condemnation. You, you need to be aware of this, see, uh, because I talk about the anointing. I did a special teaching on the anointing, and I point out in that teaching that many of the people who are filled with the Holy Ghost are not walking in the Holy Ghost because they don't yield themselves and allow themselves to live and walk in the Spirit as saints of God the way they're supposed to. And so this causes contention and divisions in the body of Christ and those people that are like that who want to continue walking in the flesh, they don't like being around you because just being around you and hearing your conversation and observing your way of living brings condemnation on them. You see, con darkness, glory to God, darkness cannot dwell in the midst of light. To use a natural example, when you when you enter a dark room and in your house or somewhere else and you turn on the light switch and the light comes on, the darkness that was in that room has to flee. It cannot remain. Once that light switch is turned on and once that light bulb is illuminated and, and light is produced, the darkness that was in that room has to flee. In the spiritual sense, so it is with one who is walking in the spirit and one who, though they are filled with the spirit, choose to walk in darkness. Such a one who does this is a liar. And they're not abiding in the truth. The Apostle John once said, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. This comes from 1 John, 1st chapter, verse 6. One of the main reasons there is division in the body of Christ is because light and darkness cannot dwell in the same space. As a matter of fact, in some cases, God requires us and commands us to separate ourselves from those sons of God who choose to walk in darkness. And notice I keep emphasizing the word choose. Spirit-filled children of God who walk in darkness, they choose to do that. Glory to God. They choose. They make a choice. They don't have to walk in darkness. Once we're filled with God's Spirit, once we have the power of God's Spirit and the Word of God, we don't have to walk in darkness. It's something that we choose to do. Glory to God. So in some cases, the Lord commands us to withdraw ourselves from such people who do this. For example, we are commanded to withdraw from a brother or a sister who is a known fornicator. As it is written, the Apostle Paul is speaking here, he says, I wrote unto you in an epistle 
not to company with fornicators. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of the world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such a one know not to eat. And this comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. So if we know, I'm not talking about something we may hear, you know, some rumor we may have heard or something, but if we know, if we know for a fact as children of God that there is a known Son of God among us, and when I say Son of God, I'm talking about sister or brother in Christ. If we know that they are fornicated, that they're lying around in sexual fornicating relationships with other people, we're not to keep company with them. This is a commandment from God. We're not to keep company with them. We are to withdraw ourselves from them and not to keep company. And Paul mentions, this is not talking about a fornicator in the world. There are many fornicators in the world, and just because of that, we're not to withdraw ourselves from them in the world. You know, many of us work we're on our jobs, and we work with fornicators, and fornicators are in our families, and we may have associates or friends that are fornicators in the world. Paul's not telling us to withdraw ourselves from them, but he's saying that if someone who calls themselves a brother or a sister in Christ, if they are a fornicator, he's saying withdraw. Don't fellowship with them. Glory to God. Don't hate them, but withdraw yourself from them and don't fellowship and hang with them until they have repented and turned away from their life of fornication or whatever else it is. Because Paul wasn't just talking about fornicators. He said, if a brother be fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard, glory to God, or an extortioner, any of those categories, Paul says, withdraw yourselves from them. Don't keep company with those types of people. Glory to God. We are instructed by the scriptures that judgment begins at the house of God. As children of God, we are to judge those who are in Christ. And if we love our brothers and our sisters in Christ, we will rebuke and reprove them in meekness and in love. But make no mistake about it. There will be of necessity divisions, disagreements, and frictions among the people of God. These things won't happen because we hate our brothers and sisters in Christ, but these things will happen because God requires holiness and sanctification among his people. And he requires that those of us who are walking in the spirit, will sometimes separate ourselves from those who are out of order and walking in the flesh. 
we don't do this because we, you know, because we want division or because we want confusion or disunity in the body of Christ. We do it because it's, it is a commandment of God. We do it because God does not want his spirit-filled holy people keeping company with people that are willingly walking in the flesh, even though they're in the body of Christ. But if they're willfully walking in the flesh, willfully lying around in fornication, willfully lying, willfully being an extortioner, willfully being a covetous person, or something of this nature, God does not want us keeping company with them, hanging around with them, because light and darkness <coughs> cannot dwell together in the same space. The scriptures tell us that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And no, no darkness at all in God. And that's the way he wants us to be as his children. We're told that we have to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Glory to God. So we, we can't do that if we're going to be hanging around with and keeping company with people who are known fornicators, known liars, known covetous people and things of this nature, we have to withdraw ourselves. Glory to God. Withdraw ourselves. Glory to God. Not because we don't like them and not because we hate them, but because we are children of God and because we want to uphold the standard of holiness, godliness, and righteousness. And we want that errant brother or sister to look upon our holy conduct, to feel condemned, to repent, to turn from their unrighteousness, and then, of course, we will forgive them. We'll forgive them and welcome them back. Go to God and to the fold. But as long as they're willfully walking in the flesh and willfully doing these things, God says, withdraw yourself. Come away, come away from among them. Don't be hanging with them. Don't be in company with them, but withdraw yourself. Glory to God, and then he will accept us. So, <clears throat> let this brief post serve as a, a reality check for many of you who are in the body of Christ. Yes, God wants us to be fellowship with one another. God just God wants us to walk by the same rule and to speak the same things. God wants us to be in the unity of the Spirit. But you can't be in the unity of the Spirit with a child of God who is walking in the flesh. It's impossible. The only way we're going to be in unity in the Spirit is if all of us are walking in the Spirit walking by the word of God, endeavoring to be holy and sanctified and endeavoring to please God. Beyond that, we can't walk together in the Spirit. The only way we can have unity is through the Spirit of God. That is our unifying power, the Spirit of God. But once we depart from that and live a life in the flesh, there can be no unity between us and the Spirit, because if one of us is walking in the flesh and one of us is choosing to walk in the Spirit, there can't be any unity in the Spirit, in reality. So, <clears throat> so even though we're, we're, we're told to walk in the, you know, in the unity of the Spirit and whatnot, we can't do that. If the other brother is choosing to walk in the flesh and we are commanded to withdraw ourselves 
and to fellowship with those that are like-minded as we are, walking in the Spirit, pleasing God, doing the will of God. But realize this, realize this, there will not be peace in the body of Christ among all of the saints. And if you thought that Christ had promised you that there would be peace among all the saints in this life, you need to think again. That's not the promise that the Lord gave us, those of us that are in the body of Christ. Glory to God. The reason you can't have peace among all the children of God in the body of Christ goes right back to the things that I just spoke about a couple of minutes ago. Glory to God. So, <clears throat> in order for us to have peace in the body and peace with one another, we must all be walking in the Spirit and striving to live in the Spirit, striving to do the will of God. Glory to God. But if there are people that are deliberately walking in the flesh and living in sin, Glory to God, we can't have peace with that brother, that sister, until they reconcile themselves with the Lord and come back into proper fellowship with him. So we should withdraw ourselves from them. Glory to God. That said, you can always have peace in your own mind as an individual in Christ. If you do what the Lord told us to do as individuals, it's, you know, no matter what else is going on, no matter if there's not an absence of confusion and division and whatnot among us and some of the children of God, we can yet have peace. Even in the midst of this, we can still have personal peace. Glory to God. But we have to do what the Lord told us to do in order to do this. God said in his word, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Glory to God. So God has given us as children of God this promise individually, despite what else is going on, despite the divisions in the body of Christ, despite confusion, despite other things that may be going on, whatever they are, despite what things are going on in our personal lives, God has promised us that he would keep us in perfect peace. Not just peace. He said perfect peace. Perfect peace. But here's what we have to do. Whose mind is stayed on him. If we stay our minds on God, and on his word, and if we trust him, God has promised that no matter what the situation or circumstance may be, he would keep us. Not only in peace, but he would keep us in perfect peace. So we can have perfect peace despite everything else that's going on. We can have perfect peace if our minds are stayed on the Lord and if we trust him. Glory to God. May your mind be stayed on him. And may peace in your individual life be yours. No matter what is going on inside or outside of the body of Christ. God bless you.